As is our tradition, the speaker for the December graduate commencement ceremony is our distinguished professor for that particular year. Professor John Kressler is the Schlumberger Chaired Professor in Georgia Tech School of Electrical and Computer Engineering. Dr. Kressler's research is focused on developing novel micro nano electronic devices, circuits, and systems for next gener generation applications within global electronics infrastructure. He and his research team attempt to break the business as usual mold in this field and reimagine the way electronics in the 21st century can and should be practiced. Dr. Kressler and his students have published more than 600 scientific papers in this field. And Dr. Kressler himself, as you'll hear later on, is also the author of several novels. He's a Georgia Tech alumnus, earning his bachelor's degree in physics in 1984. After a successful career at IBM Research, he left to pursue his dream of becoming a professor. He earned both his master's and PhD from Columbia University. He served as advisor to some 41 PhD students during his academic career. In addition to being an outstanding researcher, he's an outstanding teacher. He's the recipient of the 2010 Class of 1940 W. Howard Ector Outstanding Teaching Award, the 2011 IEEE Leon Kirchmayer Graduate Teaching Award, and the Class of 1934 Distinguished Professor Award, which is the highest honor Georgia Tech bestows upon its faculty. He and his wife, Maria, have three children and two grandchildren. Please join me in welcoming Professor John Kressler. Thanks, Bud, for the kind introduction, and good evening, everybody. It is truly a rare pr privilege for me to be with you to share this joyful occasion. So thank you for having me. A dear family friend, Father Ed Robleski, was for many years a professor of homiletics at Marion Old Seminary in New York. Basically, he taught young priests how to give great sermons. He said the most common questions his students asked him was this, how long should I talk? Father Ed's response, oh, that's easy. Talk for as long as you're interesting. That might be two minutes, that might be 102 minutes. But when you're no longer interesting, please, please, please sit down and be quiet. I'm going to be interesting for exactly 18 minutes and then I'm gonna sit down and be quiet. So here's the deal. It's a well-known fact that a commencement address is the toughest speaking gig on the planet. Why? Two reasons. Number one, I am the last thing standing between you and your degrees. Never a great place to be. But number two is this. By my crude reckoning, as of tonight, there have been exactly 449,502 college commencement speeches given in America. Yep, I'm 449,503, me. Surely everything that can be said has been said and said a hundred times over by now. And yet, and yet this very night, on this very campus, in this great institution, I will talk about something that has never once been the subject of a college commencement address. As far as I can tell, not one single time. Never, zilch, zippo. Curious? I'm gonna talk about love, L-O-V-E, love. You heard me, I'm gonna talk about love. They gave me the podium, that's what I can do. <laughs> you may wanna hang on to your seat rather tightly. So, love, what is love exactly? Well, that's an excellent question. For one thing, love in its many guises is the bedrock upon which the world's greatest literature, the world's greatest art, and the world's greatest music rests. Coincidence? 
No, I don't think so. And of course, love sits at the very core of all of the world's religions. Love defines all good relationships, and love shapes how we see and interact with the world and our cosmos. Love is actually a pretty big deal, certainly worthy of a commencement address. One thing is for sure, the word love in English, that seemingly simple four-letter word, has as many varied and nuanced meanings as stars in the sky. As a writer, I treasure that magical ambiguity firmly entrenched in our English language. One simple word, so many layers, so many textures, so much depth. The ancient Greeks were actually the first to try to explain love. They almost got it right. Almost. The Greeks believed that there were actually four different kinds of love, and they invented a word for each one of those. Philia, the love between friends. Storge, the love of parents for their children. Eros, romantic love, the love of desire and longing to find completion in the other. And agape, selfless, unconditional love. Each form of love can, of course, operate separately or in tandem with the others. Philia, storge, eros, agape. Well, sad to say, the ancient Greeks actually missed one. Yep, they left one facet of love out. And let it never be said that Georgia Tech professors aren't bold. I'm here to tell you there's actually a fifth form of love. And that's a love you've never heard of, but it's something that each of you should know a little bit of something about. I call this fifth kind of love bliss, a word first used in this context by the great professor and mythologist Joseph Campbell. Bliss, B-L-I-S-S. -S. Campbell's bliss is the culmination of the toughest challenge you will face in your life. That challenge, to discover your original purpose. He believed, as do I, that each person possesses a unique original purpose. This idea actually traces back almost 500 years to a Spaniard named Ignatius of Loyola. Ignatius believed that we must each discover why it was that we were placed on this planet. At this particular location, at this particular moment of history. Think of your original purpose as your unique calling in life. And having found that calling, we are then charged to live it out in all of its glory. Think of your original purpose as your vocation, what you were meant to be and do. Original purpose, capital O, uh, capital, o capital P. Campbell and Ignatius would have agreed on the following fact. When you do finally discover that original purpose and you begin to live the life you were meant to live, a keen resonance between you and the universe begins to unfold and blossom. A deepening, a sweetening, a rare kind of joy. A new kind of love actually develops, a love that transforms your heart in many profound ways, that's bliss, a fifth form of love. Let me share a little about love in my own life, my own original purpose, and my own bliss. And at the same time, I'd like to invite each of you, both graduates and families alike, to reflect a moment on love in your lives. Here goes. I had the great fortune to meet my best friend and soulmate at the beginning of ninth grade in the last two seats of the fifth row of Miss Crook's Honors English class at Roswell High School, just up the road. Now, I was born and raised in rural North Georgia, out in the sticks. Here was a real live Italian girl, straight from Connecticut. You know, Yankee land. Yep, I thought she was pretty awesome. And within weeks, we were best friends, 
And then four years later on graduation night, we had our first date. I married that girl, my Maria, 31 years ago this Wednesday. Thank you. Check this out. I was a junior at Georgia Tech, and we were only 21 when we joined our lives together forever. Crazy, huh? We're talking some serious eros. <laughs> and I will tell you that to this day, she can still take my breath away with a simple look. She can melt my heart when she walks into a room. She's behind every great thing I have ever done in my life. And yes, we are still best friends. In fact, she's sitting right over there. Wave, Maria. <laughs> Eros, oh, you better believe it. But also, philia and agape. And a year and a half later, when we began loving our children into this world, also storge. Four kinds of love were there, all except the bliss. Now, don't get me wrong. We had a great life. We were madly in love. We were very happy. We moved to Connecticut, back to Yankee Land, to start our family. And I had my dream job at IBM Research, which I found deeply satisfying. But the bliss didn't happen for six more years. And then, well, and then one day a friend told me they needed an adjunct professor at the local university, Western Connecticut State in Danbury. Someone that could teach calculus to night classes. Would I be interested? Well, we needed the money. We had two kids and had one more on the way at that point. And while I'd never thought much about teaching, why not at least give it a shot? It was a clear and cold Connecticut night, a half foot of snow on the ground. The 10th of January, 1989, it was a Tuesday. I stepped for the very first time in front of a classroom full of students, my classroom my students. I remember the moment like it was yesterday. There was this sudden inescapable feeling of what exactly? Well, that a teacher is what I was called to be and do. This wasn't some calculation, some head game. It came right from my heart, from deep within me. A vocation, my vocation. Yes, my original purpose. It was a sudden realization that being a teacher was what I was meant to do all along. And it was always there waiting for me to discover. I can tell you it was a thrilling moment, and it was a little scary, too. I had no clue what teaching was about. Within two years, we had left our fans, friends, and family and community in Connecticut, our comfortable life, and I jumped out into space to join the faculty at Auburn University. Professor Kressler, I liked the sound of it, but truly I had no clue whether I was ever going to be any good at it. Still, I couldn't deny the feelings that were in my heart, that gentle call from the unnameable center of my being, my original purpose, my bliss, I can tell you quite truthfully that not a single moment of a single day has gone by. I have never regretted that decision to become a teacher. I love being a Georgia Tech professor. I have the best job on the planet. You're kind. Thank you. And please don't tell Bud Peterson this, but I would do my job for half of what he pays me. Shh. Yes, I find bliss in my teaching on a daily basis, in the classroom when I step front and center, and with these bright young folks gathered here as I try to teach them and mentor them so that they can become the next great researchers and teachers for our world. 23 years of bliss and counting. I consider myself very, very lucky, blessed in fact. But oddly enough, and there is a moral to this part of the story, there were other plans in store for me as well. 
more to my original purpose than just being a teacher. Yes, I have discovered new facets of what I am called to be and do, ones that I never suspected were lurking back there in the shadows, ones that came much later in my life. One beautiful discovery was my calling as a writer. Yep, before you stands a part-time novelist. I feel bliss in my heart when I sit and I imagine and I set words to paper. I feel bliss in the marrow of my bones when I create new characters and tell their stories. What do I write about? Well, it shouldn't surprise you. I write love stories. Love stories set in ancient times, but love stories with a serious point to make for the modern world. And there was more still to discover about my original purpose. I have come to understand that part of my life's calling lies in serving the less fortunate than myself. When I say serving, I mean being present to, helping out, getting to know, even becoming friends with the disadvantaged of the world, the outcasts of society, our culture's throwaways. Here, there are no preconceived expectations of getting anything whatsoever in return. I'm talking about agape, selfless, unconditional love. An example? Well, in Connecticut, Marie and I spent six years going weekly into a federal prison to be with the inmates and get to know them. For three years now in Atlanta, I have been engaged each Saturday morning in serving the homeless community on the west side of the city. Feeding them, clothing them, getting to know them, just spending time with them. Let me be clear, those were not easy paths for me to walk. Stepping outside my comfort zone is not a simple thing for me. Sometimes it has been Maria dragging me, kicking and screaming some, down some new path, which is awfully scary. But inevitably, magically, wonderfully, those paths have always led me to this bliss, a deeper sense of my personal fulfillment. As a result, I know for certain that they are a part of my original purpose. In my experience, agape and bliss are very often intimately linked together. The takeaway here is that original purpose can and usually does span many different aspects of who you are, who you are meant to become. Much is asked of those to whom much is given. But you must listen to the gentle movements of your heart, and you must search for your own original purpose, find your own bliss, the feelings of that unique fifth form of love patiently waiting inside of you. You must claim the certainty that you are doing the things that you were called to do, being the person that you were called to be, bliss. So much for me. I would like to speak a moment with the families and friends gathered here. You students are welcome to listen in if you would like to. You moms and dads, you grandmas and grandpas, you have given Georgia Tech a great gift. You have given our world a great gift. You have entrusted us with your babies, those amazing creations that you loved into this world your own storge and agape. Yes, you thought they were brilliant when you held them in your arms that very first time so long ago. How could a parent not? But as it turns out, you were right. They are brilliant. They are accomplished. They are gifted. It has been a rare privilege for me as a Georgia Tech professor to teach them and to mentor them and to laugh with them and learn from them, and yes, even occasionally to throw up my arms in exasperation and say, can't you finish the darn dissertation? But those are rare moments. These students before you, your children, your babies, are indeed exceptional creations, great gifts to our world. And I believe from the bottom of my heart that our planet, our future, is in very safe hands and I thank you for that gift. Finally, let me speak for a moment with you students. Your families and friends are welcome to listen in if they would like. 
You have done great things. You have gotten out. You have finished the race. Yes, you survived Georgia Tech. You have made friends. You have learned. You have struggled. Yes, you cursed your professors from time to time. You know you did. Uh, but in the end, you have triumphed. And hopefully along the way, you have tasted that rare and satisfying gift of creativity in your research, the joy of your own teaching and mentoring. Bravo. And yet, and yet you did not get here by chance, nor did you do it on your own. Yep, you had help. I would invite you at a calm moment later this evening, or perhaps sometime this weekend when the parties begin to die out, to think about those who have helped you get where you are, who helped you succeed, who laid the foundation upon which you walk today. Your moms and dads, your grandmas and grandpas, your brothers and sisters, your girlfriends and boyfriends, your husband and wives, your friends, yes, even your professors. You owe them a great debt. You might start by telling them, yep, that you love them. And you might pay them back for all of those gifts that they bestowed upon you by listening, by searching, by discovering your own original purpose, and then by living that out and finding your bliss. You owe them that. You owe yourselves that and you owe our world that. Let me leave you with Joseph Campbell's famous imperative. He said, follow your bliss. If you follow your bliss, you put yourself on a kind of track that has been there the whole while waiting for you. And the life you ought to be living is the one you are living. My invitation, my challenge to each one of you students is twofold. Number one, listen to the gentle movements of your heart and seek your own original purpose. Then choose to follow that bliss no matter where it leads you. Maybe you will be called to be a great researcher or maybe a great teacher or maybe a great mommy or a daddy. Or maybe you will be called to step outside your comfort zone and do some kind of service work for others, some pure agape. Whatever it is, Discover it and live it. Number two, open your hearts and make the time for love in all of its many beautiful forms. Eros, philia, storge, agape, and bliss. Give and love and receive love. Take the time. And tell those people that are important to you that you love them and that you cherish them. They're sitting right up there. There you have it, a commencement address on love, number 449,503. I have officially said everything interesting I had to say, and now I will sit down and I will be quiet. Congratulations and thanks for listening.